All right, well, again, bless the Sabbath to each and every one of you. Uh, before we begin, let us kneel, if possible, one more time for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, Jehovah, Father, I pray that you will grant me of your Holy Spirit and you will help me, Father, to convey accurately the information that has been written and put together uh, for the purpose of understanding um, the truth that you have given to the saints and that we are to contend for. We thank you and we ask for, again, your assistance, and we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, when the pioneers discussed or taught on the personhood of God, it was more known by the personality of God. The personality of God. And that's what we want to look at uh, this, this morning. What is it that they taught? And perhaps you will also um, understand why I found that it, this also should be shared. I know we've talked quite a bit on this topic, but here's a different perspective or a different angle that will help us and will establish us in, the, in this pillar. So we will begin by reading um, from Galatians chapter 3, verse 20. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. What do you say? Amen. God is one. And the founders of the movement, of the Adventist movement, they taught and believed that God was one. Right? So is this teaching important for us to understand today? Yes, uh, eternal life or everlasting life consists of knowing the only true God, according to Jesus, and Jesus Christ whom he had sent. So that's what Jesus said. But for one, um, it is a pillar of our faith. And that's why it's important for us to understand it. Um, and another reason why is because if we understand it, we need to Proclaim it. So those are two uh, reasons why this is important for us to understand. So we will begin by a quote from Mrs. White, where she penned, The Lord has declared that the history of the past shall be rehearsed as we enter upon the closing work. Every truth that he has given for these last days is to be proclaimed to the world. Every pillar that he has established is to be strengthened. We cannot now step off the foundation that God has established. There is a need now to rehearse the experience of the men who acted a part in the establishment of our work at the beginning. So notice here that as we approach the closing work, what are we called to do? To re rehearse those things that took part in the beginning, right? And so notice also that every truth that he has given to us for these last days, she says is to be proclaimed, and she also stated every what? Pillar. Pillar. Notice also we cannot now step off the foundation that God has established. So these things have been established, but the question now that I would like to ask is, the teaching of God, or the personality of God, is it a pillar? Well, same author will let her respond by reading. Those who seek to remove the old landmarks are not holding fast. They are not remembering how they have received and heard. Those who try to bring in theories that would remove the pillars of our faith, notice now, Concerning the sanctuary or concerning the personality of God or our Christ are working as blind men. They are seeking to bring in uncertainties and to sit the people of God adrift 
without an anchor. Is there uncertainties today? Yes, they abound. They abound. But notice here that we read the pillars of our faith. Uh, she goes on to point the sanctuary, of course, and the personality of God or of Christ. And those who have departed from this truth are working as men that can see? No. As men who have lost their sight. Blind men is the inspiration. And today, because of our blindness, we, um, we believe and we go on to teach that the teaching of the personality of God has progressed. New light has been given on this subject, and we have now an accurate understanding of it. And our accurate understanding defines God as a triune God, as a trinity God, because the light has become brighter and brighter. You see? That's, uh, this idea is gaining ground, but it's not new. And so if you have never taken the time to study this, and if you hear this, you might fall for it, right? In 1949, notice what this gentleman, Spalding, penned. The pioneers dug for truth as for hidden treasure. James White, Joseph Bates, Hera Metzen, John N. Andrews, and others queried out the building stones to make the temple. They found the ineffable mystery of the oneness of God, where? In the Trinity. You see that? Now he points out that these men were students of the scriptures. And in their study of the scriptures, they found what? The triune God. Now, is, it, is this true? Is this a true statement? Well, you would think that this gentleman, gentleman would have known better because two years before, in 1947, in a letter to Lacey, this is what he penned. Notice, did all the fathers sin? That's a question. He's referring to the fathers of our faith. And if so, did they repent? How prove the unity of our faith in our succession if our pioneers were Arians and we are Athanasians? So here he's acknowledging that the pioneers were what, according to this letter? They were Arians. But in 1949, he said, that the pioneers found the truth of God in the Trinity. You see that? Now, we don't know his heart, we don't know his motives, but we have here the evidence of what this man uh, penned. And it's interesting because he starts off, or one of the, one of the questions here is, if our father sinned. Is he implied that they sin? And if so, they did repent. Well, today the teaching that Jesus was begotten of God in a real sense of the word is uh, labeled as a heresy and therefore would be considered as sin. So that's why there's a need for us to really study this matter. Right? And... Uh, I would like to share some scriptures, or not scriptures, but some inspired statements in, that'll touch on this regard. Notice now. We need to urge all to put on their spiritual eyeglasses to have their eyes anointed that they may see clearly and discern what? The true pillars of the faith. Then they will know that the foundation of God stands sure 
Having this seal, the Lord knows them that are His. Now, we need to revive the old evidences of the faith once delivered to the saints. What needs to be revived? The old evidences of the faith. And notice what else she says. The faith that was once delivered to the saints. And in connection with the pillars of our faith. Now keep this term in mind because of the next statement by her husband, James White. This is uh, what, he, what he penned. I beheld till thrones were cast down, set up, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and their hair of his hair like the pure wool. The Ancient of Days, or God, has a head and hair on his head, and a body, as David saw him clad with a snow-white garment. You will know that this was very important for them, and this was actually the core of the teaching of the personality of God from what I understand, okay? So I'll keep reading. Paul, speaking of Christ, in Hebrews chapter 1 says, who being in the brightness of his, of his, that is God's glory, and the express image of his, or God's person, and now God is a person, for he made man in his own image, so is his only begotten son, Jesus. And this same Jesus is to sit on David's throne in the literal city on the new earth under the whole heavens. Now, what does he go on to say? This is the faith once delivered to the saints and will live in spite of modern spiritualism. And for this, we are to earnestly contend. So according to James White, what is this that consists of the faith that was once delivered to the saints? Well, that God is a person and that Christ is the glory and the express image of his or God's person. This is the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And if you do more research on this, he's commenting on Jude, on the book of Jude where a denial of God and his son is um, brought forth. So now let's look at what they actually taught. And there was quite an abundance of information on this. Um, and obviously, I've, I didn't add everything on here, but let us look um, what this teaching is, the personality of God, the personhood of God. So let's take a, a, some time to look at a few statements. We'll begin with Mrs. White. Notice here. In February of 1845, I had a vision of events commencing with the midnight cry. I saw his throne, and on it sat the Father and Son. I gazed on Jesus' countenance and admired his lovely person. The Father's person I could not behold, for a cloud of glorious light covered him. I asked Jesus if his Father had a form like himself. He said, he had, but I could not behold it. For said he, if you should once behold the glory of his person, you would cease to exist. So what did Ellen White see in this vision? She saw the Father. And the son, correct? And she asked if the father had a form like himself. Interesting question. She wanted to know, does the father have a form like you have? What was the response? Yes, he does. So she saw the son, and she saw only a cloud or a light cloud that was covering the Father, right? She couldn't see the Father because as soon as she would see the Father, she would what? She would die. She would cease to exist. 
James White. You can read the whole article. This is on personality of God. Those who deny the personality of God say that image here does not mean physical form, but moral image. So notice, physical form, tangible form, body parts, a head, hair, nose, eyes, etc. Frisbee, 1854. Some seem to suppose it argues against the personality of God because he is a spirit and say that he is without body or what? Parts. So God is a spirit, so that means that he has no form. He has no body or parts. He doesn't have hands. He doesn't have eyes. That was uh, the teaching back in those days, and it's still alive and well today. But that was uh, one of the things that they um, expound, exp expounded on he pretty heavily, I would say. And this is what they understood as a personality of God. He was a tangible being. This is Loughborough. If God is an immaterial spirit, then Moses cannot see him. For we are told a spirit cannot be seen by natural eyes. There would then be no pro propriety for God to say he would put his hand over Moses' face while he passed by seemingly to prevent him from seeing his face, for he could not see him. Neither do we conceive how an immaterial hand could obstruct the rays of light from passing to Moses' eyes. But if the position be true that God is immaterial and cannot be seen by the natural eye, the text above is all superfluous. What sense is there in saying God put his hand over Moses' face to prevent him from seeing that which could not be seen. You see that? So what is he bringing forth? That, the same concept. That God has a form. He has material. He's a being with legs, arms, etc. Correct? That's just a spirit with no body parts. He goes on to say, Christ is in the form of God and in the form of men. This at once reveals to us the form of God. Daniel, speaking of God, calls him the Ancient of Days, Daniel 7, 9. And the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his hair like the pure wool. This personage is said to have a head and hair, there certainly could not be said of him if he was immaterial and had no form. That's why we have hair and head and arms, etc. Because we were made in God's image. You see that? If God is three, like I stated in my, in my last presentation, where are my other two? This is important. So James White and Uriah Smith they were commenting on Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, that man was made in the image of God. And this is what they had to say um, in this one book, the Biblical Institute. And I don't know if you can see what it reads there, but there were lectures on the principal doctrines of seven-day Adventists. If you want to learn what these are, get this book. Um, so anyhow, it had reference to only, I'm sorry, it had reference only to outward shape and form, for God is a person and has a form. Philippians 2.6, Hebrews 1.3, Revelation 5.1, Daniel 7.9, Exodus 24.10, 33, 20, ver 20 to verses 23, where the word image is used in a figurative sense, it is applied to something which we do not possess by nature, but which we must put on. Colossians 3.10, explained by Ephesians 4.23 and 24. So once again, it's the same concept. They're pushing that God has a form. Are we understanding that? Yeah. So before citing this other, uh, he probably was not a founder, but 
I, I would consider him a pioneer, but he was a contemporary to Mrs. White and later became a very controversial um, person because he abandoned the faith. But when he was in the movement, he actually put together a number of, of articles on this very topic. And um, I just recently found what I'm going to share here. So his name is D.M. Canwright. How many have you heard of D.M. Canwright? Most likely um, a good hand of you have heard of D.M. Canwright. So before reading, uh, reading articles from D.M. Canwright, I want to share this following statement from James White. Mrs. White had an appointment to speak in the Colorado tent at Boulder City on the evening of the 11th. So in the morning, we took Elder Canwright to the place with us. On our journey to this um, state, and for the first few weeks after our arrival, we needed his assistance, and he acted the part of a true Christian brother. Amen. We have had many precious seasons of prayer together at the family altar, and when bowed together in the evergreen groves of the mountains, here we have, after prayer and careful deliberation, decided very important matters pertaining to the cause. And here, too, we have assisted him in the revision of his very valuable work entitled, notice now, The Bible from Heaven and his articles on the personality of God, the divinity of Christ, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to be published in pamphlet form while he assisted us on some important works. So what did they do? What did James and Alan White do? They assisted him in the revision of these articles. Articles on the personality of God, the divinity of Christ, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What does the term revision mean? What does that mean? They read the articles. They knew what was being put in writing, right? So they were aware of D.M. Canwright's views. That's important for us to understand. So now I will cite from D.M. Canwright. Here's the first statement. God is a real person having a body, form, and local habitation. Man is made in his image. The God of the Bible is not a mere principle, an essence or soul of the universe, but he is a real personal being having a body, form, shape, and local habitation, a throne, etc. But let us listen first to what the creeds say of him. So first, he's saying basically what we have read, right? The same thing that Loughborough Penn, Mrs. White, James White, right, Frisbee, same thought. They're in harmony. So now he quotes from this Methodist article, and this is what it states. There is but one living and true God, everlasting, without body, parts, or passions. Now he's citing from this article, which is a Methodist discipline back in those days. And that was the, the teaching that they held to. Right? And he goes on to, to state, the article of faith of the Episcopal Church are even worse. Article 1 says, there is but one living and true God, everlasting without body, parts, or passions. And now he goes on to say, other creeds go still further and say that he is without center of circumference. In all candor, I submit that such a description of God annihilates him entirely. What annihilates God entirely? This creed. The way that they describe God. He has no body, no parts, no passions, dwells nowhere in particular, has no center, no circumference. If a man were called upon to describe a non-entity, he could not do it more perfectly than it is done in the above language. Would you agree? So this is what uh, the pioneers 
not only believed in regard to the personality of God, but they also saw as error those who taught that God didn't have body parts or a form. Who was teaching that in Adventism? The warnings to John Harvey Kellogg and his teaching of God. Was Harvey Kellogg teaching that God didn't have body parts, a form? Let's read. I have some things to say to our teachers in reference to the new book, The Living Temple. Be careful how you sustain the sentiments of this book regarding the personality of God. As the Lord represents matters to me, these sentiments do not bear the endorsement of God. They are a snare that the enemy has prepared for these last days. I thought that this would be that this would surely be discerned and that it would not be necessary for me to say anything about it. Now notice, but since the claim has been made that the teachings of this book can be sustained by statements from my writings, I am compelled to speak in denial of this claim. What is being said here? What is being communicated Was John Harvey Kellogg teaching once again that God, that God had no form and was out or was without body parts? Not God, the Father. Remember, he made adjustments, if you recall. He made adjustments. Not God, the Father, but someone else, right? But it's interesting um, because it was his comprehension of the Spirit of God that led him to his erroneous views. Would you agree? Now, did Mrs. White pen any statements that could have been taken or understood as pantheism? Because that's mainstream Adventism teaches or tells you and I that the apostasy of Kellogg was pantheism. That God was in the tree, in the boot, and everywhere else. Correct? That's as far as I've heard it. No more, no less. But there's more. There's more to it. So... I don't find anything in Mrs. White's writings that Kellogg, now, I'm, this is difficult to convey, but I want you to see this. Think of the idea of pantheism. And God is everywhere. I'm the Father, okay? God is everywhere. That was being taught. Later, Kellogg made adjustments. He said, God, the Holy Spirit. Ever since he had changed or made adjustments on the Trinity, now he had a fix for his opposed error. Correct? Now, going back to Mrs. White, because she says here that supposedly some of the teachings that are taught in Harvey Kellogg's book can be sustained by my writings, she says. For those who have read a little of this history, only one thing comes to mind. Kellogg was using those phrases that Mrs. White had penned on the personality of God's Holy Spirit. What do you agree? according to his own testimony. So again, I, I believe it had to do with the Spirit of God. 
Not with God the Father or Jesus, but with the Spirit of God. That was a controversy. Underhand, perhaps. You really look deep enough. And you'll see a little bit more on this. Notice the following statement. Dr. Paulson's mind is becoming confused. Our minds becoming confused today? That's so important to study on our, by our, on our own because we could get confused. So Dr. Paulson's mind is becoming confused. He thinks he understands Dr. Kellogg's teachings, but he does not discern who is Dr. Kellogg's instructor. I am bidden to say to our people, do not confound the words of Sister White with what? With the deceptive fallacies of the enemy. Now notice now, extreme views of God in nature undermine the foundation truths of the personality of God and what else? And the ministration of angels. Interesting. A confused mass of spiritualistic ideas takes the place of faith in a personal God. I take no stock whatever in some of the principles that are now being advocated. God where? Extreme views. God in nature. Those were, is that was uh, what Kellogg was teaching? That God was in nature? So is God himself in nature? Himself. His hair. His arms. His legs. Where is he? Himself. In heaven. Would you agree? Is God in nature? Yes. Through his spirit. Through his spirit. And Mrs. White says that the Lord puts the seed, the, his spirit, in what? In the seed. You see that? But these are extreme views that God is in nature. Because God can't be in nature because God is material. He has form. Body parts. Notice also the next statement. I have been instructed by the heavenly messenger that some of the reasoning in the book, the living temple, is unsound and that his reasoning would lead astray the minds of those who are not thoroughly established on the foundation principles of present truth. It introduces that which is not but speculation in regard to what? The personality of God and what else? And where his presence is. You see that? This is attached to the spirit. But in the beginning, it didn't begin that way. And that's why, again, Kellogg made some adjustments. He said, well, wait a minute here. Not God the Father. God the Holy Spirit. Is that what Trinitarians believe today? That would be a good question to ask. And by the way, we are not to argue with people. We are to reason with them. Next statement reads, the sanctuary question is clear and definite and a definite doctrine as we have ha held it as a people. And what does she tell Kellogg? You are not definitely clear on the personality of God, which is everything to us as a people. You have virtually destroyed the Lord God himself. You remember what, um, who was it? Um, was it Ken Wright? I refer to those who have annihilated God for describing him as a non-entity. Well, this is what Kella was doing. 
This is exactly what Kellogg was doing. And that's why she penned, you have virtually destroyed the Lord God himself. Another statement from D.M. Ken Wright. At the time when the Bible was written, nearly the whole world had adopted either polytheism or pantheism. Polytheism taught that there were many gods, even thousands of them. Athens is said to have 30,000 gods. Rome has had its gods. Greece had its gods. Egypt had its gods. Each was willing to allow that the other's gods were just as good as its own. Every nation, every city, and, every, and even every household had its peculiar God. In opposition to this, Moses and the prophets set forth the grand fact that this doctrine of many gods was a lie and that there was only one God, Jehovah, the living God. Amen. Bible Christians, or the Apostle Paul said it better, but unto us there is but one God, the Father. A doctrine of pantheism at the time also prevailed largely. It teaches that everything is God, the sun, the stars, the earth, water, fire, everything. Put them all together and you have God. Even this monstrous, monstrous error, the Bible denounces and sets forth in its stead the truth. That all these material things were created by a living, intelligent, personal being who is infinitely above them all. Amen. So what have we seen so far? That they believe that the personality of God referred to a, a, a God who had a form. Hair, head, etc. Correct? He had a local habitation in the heavens, in his throne, and that Jesus was his son. He had a form. And we have seen also what Kellogg, his extreme views of the personality of God, or as Mrs. White penned, of God in nature, which were dangerous teachings. So just a few statements on the personality of the son James White Penn, what is Jesus Christ? He is the Son of God and is like his Father, being the brightness of his Father's glory and the express image of his person. He is a material intelligence with body, parts, and passions, possessing immortal flesh and immortal bones. So that's why they really never looked into, if you read some of their statements, and I have a book where there's a statement, they really didn't get into the personality of the Holy Spirit because they didn't see in the Bible that the Spirit had a form. So to them, it was just one God and His Son. And of course, the Spirit, they believed in the Spirit, but they didn't have the understanding that modern Adventists have. We are living in a time when every wind of doctrine is blowing and when those who think they stand are liable to fall. We are living in a time when Satan is striving to implant seeds of skepticism and infidelity in every mind. We are living in a time when error is taught so insidiously that the faith of many is being rapidly undermined. Are we living in a time where every wind of doctrine is blowing? In 2023. Yes. We are. And oftentimes when we teach of doctrine, or we hear the word doctrine, what comes to mind? Uh, the state of the dead, or condition of the dead, the Sabbath, the second coming of Christ, the law, etc. But, I would also add that anything that pertains to the Bible and you're being taught a certain way, it's a teaching. It's a doctrine. So not necessarily only applies to those things that we consider doctrines as the, the few uh, that I name, 
but even on other things. Anything that is teaching you could be a win of doctrine. If it's teaching us contrary to inspiration. That's why we need to study for ourselves. The Father, He's the source. And we'll read a few statements in regards to this. The Apostle Paul Penn, in these last days, He has spoken to us in His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the world. So we see the Father operating or working through His Son. Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for Him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and we exist through Him. So again, the Father operating through the Son. For by Him are all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. So again, the Father operating through His Son. The Father was greater than the Son and that He was first. The Son was equal with the Father in that He had received how many things from the Father? All things from the Father. All things Christ received from God. How many again? All. Thus was presented to Daniel's vision the great day when the lives of men pass in review before the judge of all the earth. The Ancient of Days is God the Father. He, the source of all being, the fountain of all law, is to preside in the judgment. And holy angels as ministers and witnesses attend. So the Ancient of Days, which is God the Father, He is the source of all being. Every being. That would include His begotten Son. And here Mrs. White Penn, all things Christ received from God, but He took to give. So in the heavenly courts, in His ministry for all created beings through the beloved Son, the Father's life flows out to all. Through the Son it returns in praise and joyous service, a tide of love to the great source of all. And thus through Christ the circuit of beneficence is complete, representing the character of the great giver, the law of life. So you, you see harmony here in these statements? I do. I see harmony. Again, D.M. can write, he penned. As the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. John 5, 26. This statement is inequivocal. The Father has life in himself, and in his great love for his Son, he bestows the same gift upon him. But it will be noticed that the Father is the one from whom the gift came. In harmony with this, the Apostle says, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him. And one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, how carefully Paul distinguishes between the Father and the Son. He says, the Father of whom are all things, and Jesus Christ, by whom are all things. The ain't, notice now, the Father is the source of everything. Jesus is the one through whom all things are done. All the authority, the glory, and the power of Christ he received from his Father. Is that pretty clear? I think it is. Now, where I, this is interesting, this is an interesting thought. Now, were I on going into a place to inquire for a minister on the, of the gospel, and one were to inform me that Roger Rowe was the only minister of the gospel in the place, and another were to tell me that two other persons were just as truly ministers of the gospel as Elder Rowe, surely the latter would contradict the former. 
And precisely so do Trinitarians contradict the Savior in this text. Are you grasping that thought? Because Jesus said the only true God. That refers to the Father being the source of all. Does this deny the divinity of Christ as some would claim that we, we do? Well, they even, they believe that the pioneers denied the divinity of Christ in their day, correct? That was the belief that Seventh-day Adventists don't believe in the divinity of Christ. Why? Because they believe that he was begotten. And they did believe that God was one. And nothing could be further from the truth. We believe in Christ's divinity. Amen? So, just some, some final thoughts. You know, some, and yeah, I will confess, not only I have heard someone ask, but I, at times, this thought has risen in my mind. Why did she have to say that? Why did she have to write that? You know those writings like the third person of the Godhead? The Holy Spirit is as much as a person as God is a person. You know those statements and many more? And many embrace and don't want to take a look, I would say, at the entire picture. But that's nothing new. How many denominations are in this land, just America, North America, here in the United States? How many? Thousands. And where do they derive their beliefs? From the Bible. And I remember having a conversation with someone years ago about the immortality of the soul. And we were very familiar with those uh, passages of Scripture that uh, point to as the condition of the dead, right? The state of the dead. We're very familiar with those Ecclesiastes and so on. When Jesus refers to death as a sleep, some of us even have those highlighted. Well, I was shown a scripture or a passage that I had never read before where Elijah is praying or requesting for the soul of that one child. I don't know if you remember that account where the widow lost uh, his child, I believe. He died. And in prayer, he's requesting for the soul of the child to return to him. Well, we don't believe that the soul continues to live, right? Do we believe that? But if you read from the King James Version, Elijah is requesting in his prayer for the soul of the child to return to him. How do you explain that? We need to understand inspiration. Because evangelicals get a hold of those quotes. Revelation as well. They have no rest day nor night. Who worship the beast? They're thrown in the lake of fire. And their smoke goes up for how long? Forever and ever. So there's nothing new. If we want to know the truth, we need to dig. We need to study. And the truth will have a ring of truth to it. Would you agree? So we need to study. And with that, just a few quotes to end. I will encourage you. We cannot for a moment have any misrepresentation upon these solemn and important subjects of truth which have been the faith of our people since when? Since 1844. This means much to us. The faith today has changed in regards to God. By the way, she says, this means much, much to us. The Lord would have me say to you that the enemy has, through his species deceptions, 
placed this unbelief in your mind, and you have been working it out. All who receive your presentations will enter upon strange paths if they connect with you. You are bringing in strange common fire, but not the fire of God's own kindling. And now I must speak plainly to our people that the Lord has led us step by step and shown us clear light upon the heavenly sanctuary in the most holy of holies where God revealed himself to his appointed once. Do you remember what happened in 1844, right? The great disappointment. And they went back to the studies of the scriptures. After the passing of the time, king, men who were king and noble, studied. And God revealed himself to these appointed ones. What did they found? Well, we just have read the truth on the personality of God. Now, I cannot state half that I wish, but we must have no controversy with you. God has brought out a people, and his Holy Spirit has opened to them his word, clear and conclusive. We are to be light bearers to the world. All are to be a unit and follow step by step as led by the Lord. We are not to go back denying our past experience but to press forward and upward and make straight paths for our feet, lest the lame, that is the weak in faith, be turned out of the way. Are we to turn our back on the past, on the truths of the past that God gave his people? No. No. So the question is, did God lead the pioneers and the founders of this movement? He did. And that the pioneers err, were they mistaken in their understanding of God? When in fact the Lord had placed a prophet in their midst. Is there an excuse? Do we doubt that Jehovah preserved his people from falsehoods through means of a prophet? He preserved his people, and he led them step by step. And the changes were creeping slowly, but once the prophet died, here comes the new, with a generation that doesn't or did not know their true God. And here's a good question. What were the reasons for the prophetic gift anyway. What were the reasons? That's a good question. You have a movement. You have men studying the Bible after 1844, after the Great Disappointment. And according to the record, there's a point in time where not even two were in agreement. You get frustrated when some of you don't see eye to eye on certain things? That's why God raised the prophet. That's the reason why. And with that in mind, notice this. I recommend to you, dear reader, the word of God as a rule of your faith and practice. By that word, we are to be judged. God has, in that word, promised to give visions in the last days, not for a new faith, but for the comfort of his people. And what else? And to correct those who are from Bible truth. Does God doubt with Peter when he was about to send him to preach? to the Gentiles. Did John Harvey Kellogg err from Bible truth? Yes, that's why he was corrected. Did D.M. Kenwright 
under this topic of the personality of God. Was he mistaken? Well, some will say yes. Well, where's the correction? Was James White wrong? Where's the correction? Was Willie White wrong? Where's the correction? Loughborough, Smith, name them all. Where is the correction? There's a departure from those truths, but never a correction to those men who wrote abundantly on the personality of God and of Christ. If you believe this statement, you would need to find where she corrected the pioneers for their supposedly mistaken viewpoints. Because if we know the record, it shows clearly that she would not keep silent when there was a pillar that was being um, departed from. God preserved his people through means of a prophet. And those who believe that the Lord has spoken through Mrs. White will be saved from the many delusions that will come here in these last days, we are told. Do you believe that? Let us study. Let us continue to study. And uh, may these truths have an impact in your life knowing and seeing how great, how great, there's no words to describe it, the love of God is. A true God, one being, who gave his son at the point of eternal loss to cease to exist for all eternity for you, for you. This truth should impact our lives like no other truths. But sometimes we mistreat others. And this truth is not really having an impact in our lives. We can have intellectual knowledge, but what good is that? Satan has it. Doesn't he? He can cite the scriptures. What good is intellectual knowledge if it doesn't transform our character? May God help us. What do you say?